How big is the solar system? Most people know that the solar system has one star and eight planets. But did you know that it also contains five dwarf planets, at least 290 moons, more than 1.3 million asteroids, and over 3,900 comets? The solar system is, in fact, a very busy place and is a lot bigger than most people think. Join us as we take a cosmic trip through our celestial backyard. We will be exploring the sun, the planets, all the way out to the Oort cloud, and everything in between. Let's get started. Today we're diving into the sun, the central powerhouse of our solar system. This massive ball of burning gases is crucial for life on Earth, providing light and heat. Let's explore the sun's immense size, its role in keeping our planet alive, and the fascinating science behind its radiant energy. This colossal ball of burning gases sitting right at the center of our solar system is more than just a bright spot in the sky. It's a cosmic powerhouse hurling out heat, light, and some pretty mind-blowing phenomena that shape our solar neighborhood. Get ready to explore the secrets of this blazing celestial body, from its sizzling hot plasma to its magnetic fields and the mysteries that keep scientists on their toes. We will cover all that and more in today's video. I'm Mike Adams, and on this channel we cover all things space. If it's your first time here, click subscribe and click the bell so you get notified when we release new content. In today's video, we are exploring the central powerhouse of our solar system, the Sun. Space probes from NASA and Europe currently orbit the Sun, scrutinizing our star's hot plasma mechanisms, magnetic fields, and atmospheric mysteries. The focus of these missions is to deepen our understanding of solar winds and various aspects of the Sun, offering fresh insights into its workings. At the Royal Observatory of Belgium in Brussels, a century-long dedication to Sun observation has elevated its role as the global hub for the Sunspot Index. Vital data from the European Solar Orbiter, operating closer to the Sun than Mercury's orbit, is enriching our understanding with unprecedented imagery of the Sun's corona. These detailed images, unprecedented in their scale and clarity, have enthralled solar physicists, marking a groundbreaking phase in space exploration. Despite challenges posed by the Sun's harsh conditions, the Solar Orbiter, launched in 2022, has traveled over two and a half billion kilometers using gravitational assistance from Venus and Earth. The mission's primary objective is to improve space weather prediction, crucial for safeguarding Earth-based technologies like GPS satellites and power grids. Unraveling mysteries surrounding the sun's temperature variations and high-speed solar winds remains a central focus, with the solar orbiter's closer observations providing invaluable data for understanding the sun's impact on Earth and solving the long-standing puzzle of the corona's extreme heat. The Solar Orbiter's close-range observations are crucial for advancing our understanding of the Sun's behavior and its impact on Earth. Scientists are adjusting the spacecraft's orbit to explore uncharted areas like the solar poles, which are vital for studying the Sun's magnetic fields. Armed with 10 specialized instruments, the Solar Orbiter captures images across multiple frequencies from X-rays to extreme ultraviolet light. These tools, including a magnetometer, energetic particle detector, and solar wind analyzer suite, allow comprehensive measurements of electric and magnetic fields around the spacecraft. With all instruments operational, the spacecraft's diagnostic capability for studying solar plasma and the atmosphere is extensive. Instruments like the EUV Imaging Spectrometer, EUI, and SPICE provide insights into dynamics, structure, temperature, and density, offering a comprehensive understanding of coronal mass ejections. Coordinating these 10 instruments is vital for maximizing the mission's potential. The goal is to link remote sun observations with direct measurements of the solar wind, a task requiring precise synchronization among the instruments that have undergone rigorous testing and tuning for optimal function. Ultimately, this mission aims to establish connections between solar activities and their broader effects, leveraging telescopes observing various wavelengths to explore different layers of the sun's atmosphere and its magnetic field during solar events. Observations in the corona have revealed minute energy sources for the first time, prompting a focused investigation into their relationship with the broader solar wind and their impact on particle flow towards Earth Understanding this intricate correlation requires further study to pinpoint the origins of solar wind packages. Initial findings, however, suggest a successful link between surface observations and solar wind behavior. The solar orbiter's proximity to the Sun, roughly one-third of the distance between the Sun and Earth, is crucial. This closeness allows for the collection of solar wind measurements in a nearly pure state before its journey towards Earth. Combining these measurements with solar images and spectra forms a comprehensive understanding of the sun and its solar wind. Efforts are underway to assess the risks posed by solar storms on Earth, with the recent achievement of the first perihelion marking a significant scientific milestone. This accomplishment bolsters confidence in repeating this feat approximately twice a year during close encounters with the sun, facilitating data transmission and analysis for fresh insights. 
NASA's Parker Solar Probe, operational since 2018, has navigated gravitational assistance for over four years to reach its operational orbit. Overcoming significant technological challenges such as the sun's intense heat, the probe's design with an effective heat shield protects its electronics and instruments. The probe has achieved its primary goal of delving into the solar corona, revealing its boundary and collecting material still linked to the sun. Unveiling mysteries within the corona, the probe's instruments have indicated rapid acceleration of solar winds beyond its boundary, contrasting with a strengthened magnetic field and slower solar material movement within. This observation of the transition zone between the spinning corona and the outward streaming solar wind holds implications for understanding stellar aging and impacts distant solar system's habitability. This exploration contributes to understanding our sun and holds significance for stars across the universe and the hunt for habitable exoplanets. The Parker Solar Probe, a trailblazing mission, ventures closer to the sun than any prior endeavor, unraveling mysteries hidden within solar activity. This groundbreaking exploration yields new scientific insights, shedding light on enigmatic phenomena unseen from Earth due to its vast distance from the Sun. By approaching unprecedented proximity, the probe observes the genesis of the solar wind with remarkable clarity, capturing significant events dispersed over the immense span between Earth and the Sun. This vantage point allows an in-depth study of solar wind variability and intricacies that are impossible to study on our planet. Beyond solar winds, the Sun's formidable storms and eruptions threaten space travel. Understanding the mechanisms behind these events is crucial for predicting and safeguarding against hazardous particle accelerations, particularly for astronauts and spacecraft beyond Earth's protective magnetic shield. Moreover, the probe's Earth's observations confirm the scarcity of space dust near the Sun, a theory substantiated by evidence. Intense solar heat and radiation repel or vaporize nearby dust particles, creating a unique dust-free region, a revelation captured by the Parker Solar Probe. The probe aims to delve deeper into to increasingly complex solar phenomena as the mission progresses through the sun's cycles from tranquil phases to heightened activity. Spiraling closer and faster toward the sun, it continues to unlock unprecedented insights into our solar system's central celestial body. Researchers have detected unique cells on the sun's surface, generating magnetic funnels from churning convection cells where mysterious switchbacks seem to originate. The Parker Solar Probe aims to delve deeper into our sun, which is crucial for understanding our star and potentially unraveling the possibility of life beyond our solar system. It's a focal point as the only star supporting life on its orbiting planets. The upcoming Artemis missions mark a significant step towards exploring new lunar territories, seeking untouched answers since the last human visits in the 1960s. Artemis 1, an unmanned journey to the moon, is the precursor to manned flights, generating palpable anticipation among scientists and engineers eager to delve into the uncharted realm akin to an eighth continent holding untold discoveries. The lunar missions driven by collaborative efforts between ESA, NASA, and various international companies showcase technological prowess. The European Service Module, vital for sustaining human life support, undergoes rigorous monitoring and simulations to prepare for potential anomalies, ensuring meticulous preparation for launch. These missions lay the groundwork for probing the moon's mysteries, leading to future human-tended missions and landings at the lunar south pole in Artemis III. Identifying the ideal landing site remains crucial. Unlike the equatorial regions, Artemis targets the lunar south pole for potential water resources, a more demanding landing scenario. Six sites have been earmarked near the permanently shadowed regions, potentially rich in water. However, precise exploration using robots like Vice Viper is needed to pinpoint the optimal landing location. Viper, the pioneering rover tasked with mapping water resources, signifies a new phase in lunar exploration. These robots, including Viper, undergo rigorous testing in terrain mirroring lunar conditions. Additionally, the development of the Lunar Gateway offers the possibility of direct control over these rovers, reducing time delays and enabling new exploration avenues previously challenging from Earth. Currently, in Sicily, we're conducting experiments on Mount Etna to simulate lunar conditions. While the astronauts aren't aboard the National Space Station, they control operations from a hotel room. The European Space Operations Center in Germany oversees these operations, essentially role-playing as if they were on the moon. Mount Etna's slopes are an excellent replica of lunar terrain, facilitating realistic discussions and planning. The goal is to replicate lunar exploration scenarios, allowing scientists to engage deeply in discussions, considering the realistic lunar-like geology. These discussions then inform decisions made by the European Space Operations Center. They determine whether to utilize the astronaut for direct teleoperation or rely on their tools for planning more extended explorations, optimizing astronaut time. This simulation mirrors the astronauts' previous tasks on the International Space Station in 2019. Learning from the astronauts' experiences with different tools and interactions, especially communication with the science team and the operations center, is crucial. 
Understanding when to use manual controls or automated functions aids in refining operations. This complex experiment involves multiple stakeholders, various objectives, and validating relatively new space technologies. It involves intricate operational scenarios with many parties collaborating, which is challenging but immensely informative. In terms of soil conditions and harsh terrain, allows us to simulate and learn from an environment very similar to what we anticipate on the moon. In this exploration of the planets of the solar system, we are zooming in on our sun's closest neighbor, Mercury. Please sit back and relax as we take a cosmic ride through this enigmatic planet, peeling back its layers and uncovering its mysteries with jaw-dropping visuals. We're talking about everything Mercury, from its wild temperature swings to its mind-boggling spin, in a way that's easy to wrap your head around. But hold on tight, because we're not just talking about its orbit and surface. Oh no, we're peeling back the layers to uncover its funky spins, bizarre temperatures, and even its magnetic field. Plus, we've got some wild comparisons with moons that'll make you rethink everything you thought you knew about planets and moons. We'll chat about its density and gravity, and trust me, it's gonna blow your mind. Stick around till the end because I've got mind-boggling info about Mercury's funky orbit that'll make your head spin. Seriously, it's wild. We will cover all that and more in today's video. We are exploring planet Mercury's wonders. At first glance, Mercury might appear as just another rock cruising around the sun, but it's a planet filled with surprises when you take a deeper look. Think of it as a mix between our moon and something entirely different in terms of color. Unlike the moon's grayscale appearance, Mercury shows off a variety of colors that make it stand out. Here's the kicker. Most of Mercury, about 70%, is made up of metal, which is way more than we ever thought. This high metal content gives Mercury its unique vibe, making it the second densest planet in our solar system, right after Earth. It's like a dense little powerhouse hiding in plain sight among the planets. Even though it's close to Earth's size, Mercury has a different kind of gravity because it's smaller. It pulls things toward it with a force of about 3.7 meters per second squared, which is less than Mars, even though Mars is bigger. This happens because Mercury is more tightly packed inside. Mercury is more like our moon than big moons like Ganymede and Titan. It has wide flat areas and many craters from things hitting its surface. These clues suggest Mercury hasn't changed much geologically for billions of years. But there are still signs of stuff that happened in the past, like thin lines formed when its insides cooled down and made the surface harder. One big thing on Mercury is the Calorus Basin, a massive crater about 1,550 kilometers wide. When something hit Mercury and made that crater, it caused volcanoes to erupt, making a ring-like shape more than two kilometers high. Nearby, there's a strange area called the Weird Terrain, which looks totally different from most of Mercury's surface and got its name for being so unique. Mercury, our solar system's smallest planet, has undergone notable transformations on its surface over its long history. While it has been relatively calm for an extended period, evidence of significant past events remains, making it an incredibly intriguing celestial body for scientific study. One of Mercury's most striking aspects is its extreme fluctuation in surface temperatures it experiences. From an icy chill of about negative 173 degrees Celsius to an intense scorching heat of over 400 degrees Celsius, this incredible temperature swing is primarily due to Mercury's orbit around the Sun. The regions near the poles face the most frigid conditions, plummeting to approximately negative 93 degrees Celsius. Why? Mercury lacks a protective atmosphere to insulate it, causing these areas to become exceptionally cold. On the flip side, the hottest areas soar to around 400 degrees Celsius while the shadowed parts of the planet experience an average temperature of about negative 163 degrees Celsius. Now, why such extreme temperatures? Mercury's small size and its proximity to the sun play crucial roles. Its size restricts its ability to maintain an atmosphere, preventing it from effectively holding onto the heat it receives from the sun. Consequently, the side facing the sun experiences these extreme cold temperatures. Interestingly, Mercury doesn't have a robust atmosphere like Earth's, but it possesses a very thin layer called an exosphere. 
This exosphere is remarkably sparse, similar to an atmosphere, but incredibly faint in comparison. These dramatic temperature shifts and the planet's limited ability to retain heat and atmosphere contribute to the extreme variations in surface conditions across Mercury. Understanding these fluctuations sheds light on the planet's history and continues to captivate scientists studying this enigmatic world. Mercury's exosphere, the outer layer enveloping the planet, behaves uniquely due to its sparse distribution of particles held together by gravity. Unlike typical gases, it's incredibly thin. When bombarded by solar winds, Mercury's exosphere releases particles into space, leaving behind a trail of atoms. This phenomenon occurs universally among planets, marking the boundary between space and our atmosphere, starting approximately 600 kilometers above Earth's surface. Constant flux characterizes Mercury's exosphere, where particles are consistently lost and replenished from various sources. Notably, NASA made a groundbreaking discovery of water ice in craters at Mercury's North Pole, a feature not found on Mars. Moreover, Mercury boasts its magnetic field, although significantly weaker than Earth's, measuring only about 1.1% of Earth's magnetic strength. Yet this field effectively shields the planet from the onslaught of solar winds. Now let's move into Mercury's intriguing orbital and rotational behaviors. Unlike other planets, Mercury's orbit around the Sun stands out significantly and presents a puzzle. Mercury's distance from the Sun notably fluctuates, ranging between 46 million kilometers and 70 million kilometers. It completes a full orbit around the Sun in approximately 88 Earth days. The spin pattern of Mercury is rather peculiar. For every two orbits around the Sun, Mercury rotates three times on its axis. Therefore, a complete rotation on Mercury takes around 59 Earth days, termed a side real day. However, if you count from one sunrise to the next, known as a solar day, it feels like two full years on Earth. When standing on Mercury, observing the Sun becomes a remarkable experience. The Sun's movements are quite intriguing. It rises rapidly, slows around midday, switches directions, and eventually sets after a full year. Interestingly, nighttime on Mercury extends for an entire year as well. From Mercury's perspective, the Sun's motion might appear peculiar. It could seem to move backward in the sky. This phenomenon occurs because approximately four days before Mercury reaches its closest point to the Sun, known as perihelion, its rotational speed aligns with that of the Sun, causing the Sun to stall seemingly. However, Mercury's orbital speed overtakes its rotational speed during perihelion, creating the illusion of the Sun moving backward. This effect resembles a fascinating magic trick, resolving itself four days post-perihelion. Viewing Mercury from above unveils a unique event where the Sun momentarily halts and resumes its movement twice daily at one of Mercury's poles. This distinct behavior is due to Mercury's orbital tilt of seven degrees, differing from Earth's orbit. As a result, Mercury only transits across the Sun's face when it precisely aligns between Earth and the Sun, an occurrence happening approximately every seven years. Mercury's rotation is noteworthy for its minimal axial tilt, measuring a mere 0.027 degrees, even smaller than Jupiter's 3.1 degree tilt. If observed from Mercury, Earth would appear minuscule. This photo taken by the messenger probe from Mercury's viewpoint encompasses nearly all of humanity. This concludes our exploration of Mercury, offering insight into our intriguing neighbor within the solar system. Understanding these unique characteristics enriches our comprehension of the universe. We are zooming in on the second planet from the sun, Venus, a planet filled with astonishing discoveries. At first glance, it looks graceful but underneath lies a different story. Imagine extreme heat and wild volcanoes with an incredibly heavy atmosphere. Stay with us to uncover why Venus is a fiery inferno, why it spins slowly in space, and how its surface resembles something out of a sci-fi movie. We will cover all that and more in today's video. We are exploring the planet Venus. Often called Earth's twin, it is the second planet from the sun, roughly 67 million miles away. This planet is similar in size and makeup, boasting a diameter just a tad smaller than Earth's. However, 
Despite these similarities, Venus veers off course in several critical ways. Venus looks lovely from afar, just like the goddess of love it's named after. But get a closer look and you'll see a different side. Under its calm appearance, Venus is scorching hot, with active volcanoes and a super thick atmosphere. Venus is Earth's closest neighbor in our solar system, circling the Sun at an average distance of about 108 million kilometers. One thing that makes Venus special is how it moves. It travels in a nearly perfect circle compared to other planets, so its distance from the Sun doesn't change much. When Venus gets closest to Earth, it's only about 41 million kilometers away. But even though it's closer, it's not the brightest thing in the sky. That's because, at that time, we see the side of Venus that's not lit by the Sun. It's like it's between the Sun and us. But we can still see Venus because sunlight bends through its atmosphere. The brightest time we see Venus is when it looks like a thin crescent shape in the sky. At this point, it becomes the brightest thing in the night sky after the Moon. This is why sometimes people mistake Venus for a UFO, as it's quite noticeable during these times. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter once thought he saw a UFO in 1969, but later checks suggested it was probably just Venus. Many folks mistake Venus for something more exciting because it's super bright. Venus, the planet that orbits between Earth and the Sun, occasionally crosses in front of the Sun from our perspective. This rare event occurs in pairs, spaced eight years apart, but such pairs occur only about once every hundred years. The last transit was observed in 2012, and the next one won't be visible until 2117. In terms of its movement, all planets revolve counterclockwise around the Sun, including Venus. However, Venus spins in a clockwise direction, a unique characteristic among the planets. This slow rotation takes 243 Earth days for one complete turn, making a day on Venus longer than its year, which spans 224 Earth days. Because of this backward spin, a day on Venus, from sunrise to sunrise, is significantly shorter, lasting about 117 Earth days. On Venus, a year nearly equals two days on Earth. The planet's slow rotation, moving at about 6.5 kilometers per hour at its equator, results in its almost spherical shape, which is unusual considering its opposite spin compared to other planets. The reasons for this peculiar behavior remain uncertain. Possible explanations range from a past collision with a large object to unique interactions with the Sun's gravitational pull affecting Venus's atmosphere. Similar in size and mass to Earth, Venus is often called our sister planet. It's among the four inner rocky planets in our solar system. Venus is a bit smaller than Earth, about 12,100 kilometers wide compared to Earth's 12,740 kilometers. It's denser too, with a weight of 5.243 grams per cubic centimeter versus Earth's 5.514 grams per cubic centimeter. Its gravity is slightly weaker than Earth's, about 0.9 times as strong. But that's where the similarities end. On Venus, the air pressure on the ground is a whopping 92 times greater than on Earth. Think of it like going a kilometer under the ocean on Earth. That's how much pressure Venus has. The air there is almost 93 times denser than what we have here. It's mostly made of carbon dioxide with sulfur dioxide clouds that trap heat well, creating the most intense greenhouse effect in our solar system. On average, temperatures on the surface can reach about 462 degrees Celsius. Surprisingly, Venus is hotter than Mercury, even though Mercury is closer to the Sun and gets more sunlight. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere to trap heat, but Venus does. This keeps Venus consistently hot day and night without much temperature change. It's like a thermal flask keeping the heat inside. Venus doesn't tilt much, so its temperature doesn't change with the seasons. Winds on the surface aren't strong, but the thick atmosphere moves small rocks and dust around. Up in the clouds, the winds are fast, giving the impression that Venus spins faster than it does. These clouds contain acid, making Venus's conditions even harsher, although any acid rain evaporates before reaching the ground. The clouds around Venus reflect most of the sunlight and only allow about 10% to pass through. They cover the entire planet, blocking the view of the surface from space. These clouds can create lightning, similar to what happens on Earth, but not as often. 
Recently, scientists found a large, swirling thing at the south pole of Venus, similar to what you see on Saturn. Venus and Saturn look different in shape. Venus only has one big storm, while each dot on Saturn represents a separate storm with the main swirl in the middle. The swirl on Venus is about 59 kilometers above the clouds. About 50 kilometers up in Venus's atmosphere, the air pressure and temperature are similar to what you experience on Earth. Even the gravity would feel almost the same. The only problem is the air itself. But if you were in a sealed plane, it might feel like being on Earth. Talking about the surface of Venus, Russian missions from the 60s to the 80s took real pictures. Venera 7 in 1970 was the first probe to land on another planet and send back information, but it probably fell over when it landed. It measured the surface temperature at 475 degrees Celsius. Venera 8 confirmed that you could see about a kilometer clearly on the surface because the clouds stop high up, which could be good for cameras in future missions. Venera 9 sent back the first ever picture of Venus's surface. Over six years, Venera 10, 13, and 14 sent back more pictures, this time in color, and lots of information about the planet's conditions. Since then, a lot of missions have thoroughly mapped Venus's surface. They used radar to peek through the clouds and get clear pictures of the planet's landscape. Venus's surface has many big volcanoes, but they might not all be active. 167 volcanoes are more than 100 kilometers wide. On Earth, something similar in size would be the Big Island of Hawaii. But this doesn't mean Venus is super active with volcanoes compared to Earth. It's more about Venus having an older crust. Earth has its plates moving around, which heats things and keeps the surface changing every hundred million years. Venus doesn't have these moving plates. Venus's crust is thought to be 300 to 600 million years old, because of a massive event in its past. It's believed the hot layer under the crust pushed through, covering most of the surface with lava. Around 80% of Venus is covered in cooled lava plains with a ton of volcanoes in different shapes. There are 900 impact craters on Venus, but none are smaller than three kilometers across. Anything smaller burns up before hitting the surface. Now about its magnetosphere. Venus has no magnetic field, which is surprising because its makeup is like Earth's. Solar and cosmic radiation messes with Venus's upper atmosphere, causing severe lightning. The solar wind even creates a tail for Venus, similar to a comet's. Sometimes this tail interacts with Earth, but sadly, we can't see it without help. Thanks for joining me on this exploration of the planet Venus. We are exploring planet Earth's wonders. Earth isn't your average planet, it's our cosmic home. With its vast oceans, air full of oxygen, and magnetic charm, it stands alone as the bustling center of known life. However, there's plenty more to find out about our planetary home. Forget a perfectly round shape, Earth's a bit wider around its middle due to its spin. So what is the farthest point from the center of the Earth? Most think that it's Mount Everest, but it's actually a volcano in Ecuador called Chimborazo. This is due to Earth's oblong shape with a centrifugal bulge. It causes Chimborazo's peak to be over 2,074 meters farther from the center of the Earth than the peak of Mount Everest. This is despite the fact that Mount Everest actually reaches a higher elevation from sea level by over 2,700 meters. Back in ancient times, people argued about our place in the cosmos. People wondered if the Earth was flat or round. It turns out that the ancient Greeks had the right idea with the round Earth notion. However, it was Eratosthenes and his clever method that accurately measured Earth's size. The distance from one side to the other through Earth's center is 12,756 kilometers. Earth's equatorial circumference or waistline is 40,075 kilometers. For years, many thought that Earth was the center of the universe and that the Sun revolved around Earth. Thanks to Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo, we discovered that Earth is definitely not the center of the universe and that the Earth actually revolves around the Sun. Earth is approximately 150 million kilometers from the Sun. That number fluctuates between 147 million and 152 million kilometers. It takes a year to complete a full orbit around that fiery giant in the sky. But here's the thing, our time measurement method isn't as precise as most people would think. A year for us is actually 365.25 days. That's why we add an extra day, a leap year, 
every four years to compensate for those extra hours. Now, when it comes to months, initially, a month was meant to match how long the moon takes to circle Earth, so month and moon are linked. But here's the catch. The moon takes about 28 days for a full circle, and our calendars don't exactly sync up with that. Earth's spin isn't a neat 24 hours either. It's around 23 hours and 56 minutes compared to the stars. Those extra four minutes daily are needed for the sun to be in the same spot in the sky because Earth keeps moving. Our exact 24-hour days are based on where the sun is. Due to Earth's quirks, the solar days can change by up to 30 seconds each year. To balance this, we use an average solar day. Meanwhile, the moon is gradually slowing us down, making each day two milliseconds longer every century. Understanding time is more complex than it sounds. Time-lapse photos show the Earth spinning, which makes stars seem to move. A yearly analemma picture shows the sun's figure eight pattern caused by Earth's tilt and orbit. These movements create seasons and the sun's path across the sky. The side-to-side -side shift is because of Earth's orbit shape and the time equation, which relates to different kinds of solar days. This picture combines Earth's tilt, orbit, and time effects. We have yet to do this on other planets, but if we made an analemma on another planet, it would look completely different. On Earth, the 23 and a half degrees tilt creates different seasons. It's not just because the planet is close to the sun, but because sunlight is spread differently across the Earth. Changes in the distance during perihelion, the closest approach to the sun, don't have much impact on temperatures. The last perihelion happened on January 2nd, 2019. Seasons come from concentrated summer sunlight, spread out winter sunlight, and longer summer days. When sunlight reaches the land or sea, it gives off heat, affected by Earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere has 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and small amounts of gases like carbon dioxide, around 1%, and varying water vapor, ranging from 0.01% to 4%. Earth's atmosphere keeps necessary gases in, protects from meteors, and controls global temperatures, Without its ability to trap heat, the average temperature could drop by 18 degrees Celsius. The atmosphere plays a pivotal role in the movement of water around the planet. As the sun warms the earth and its oceans, the nearby air also heats up. This warm air ascends, carrying water vapor. As the vapor cools, it condenses into tiny water droplets on dust particles suspended in the air, forming clouds. These droplets can travel long distances before precipitating rain. Subsequently, water returns to the oceans through river systems, completing this continuous cycle. Water is vital for sustaining all life forms, from plants to animals and even the tiniest bacteria. The oceans cover a massive part of our planet, approximately 71%. Now, of course, the Earth isn't flat. If it were, the oceans would be almost three kilometers deep everywhere on the planet. Earth has a varied landscape because of its moving pieces called tectonic plates. Like giant puzzle pieces, the surface moves due to a thin outer layer and a hot active part underneath called the mantle. This movement creates things like volcanoes, mountains, and earthquakes. Despite the dangers, these movements keep Earth alive and fertile. Below the mantle is a core made of dense metals like iron and nickel. This core produces a massive magnetic field that protects us from the sun's particles and creates those stunning auroras we sometimes see. Our moon is unique too. It's the biggest in our whole solar system compared to its planet. It affects the ocean's tides by pulling on the water with its gravity as the Earth spins. This pull creates a bulge in the water and slightly affects the Earth's surface. These tides might be why the Earth's plates move so much. It's mind-blowing to think about everything that had to happen for life to exist here. Because of these events, almost 8 billion of us are on Earth, asking big questions and exploring our place in the universe. This image showing our planet from space is incredible. Understanding these unique characteristics enriches our comprehension of the universe. Today we're diving into Mars, the rusty red wonder in our solar system. Now this isn't your usual science class talk. Brace yourself for some mind-blowing facts. Before we head into Mars world, did you know a day on Mars is just a bit longer than Earth's? It's roughly 24 hours, 39 minutes, and 35 seconds. And get this, a year on Mars is nearly 687 days on Earth. Mars might be smaller than Earth, but it's got some serious geological power. 
Imagine a canyon three times longer and four times deeper than the Grand Canyon. That's Valley Marineris, etched into Mars's surface like a colossal scar. Another fun fact is that the tallest volcano in our solar system isn't on Earth. It's actually on Mars. Olympus Mons stands at three times the height of Mount Everest above sea level. And here's the real surprise. It's not just tall, it's vast, stretching over 600 kilometers. That's one colossal volcano. You see, Mars isn't just about rocks and craters. It's full of excitement. Dust devils whip around like mini tornadoes and gigantic dust storms sometimes cover the whole planet, enough to leave you amazed. We will cover all that and more in the wonders of planet Mars. Have you ever wondered what Earth looks like from Mars? Look at this snapshot from a spacecraft orbiting about 80 million kilometers away. Even though it might look small and a bit blurry, that's Earth. You can see the Western Hemisphere and the Moon in the background. And here's another photo from the Curiosity rover showing Earth as a tiny dot in the vastness of space. Now, Earth is much bigger than Mars, which makes it heavier. That's why gravity on Earth is more substantial than it is on Mars. If you compare them Earth on the left and Mars on the right, things fall slower on Mars than they do on Earth. If you weigh 100 kilograms on Earth, you'd only weigh about 38 kilograms on Mars. Mars is orbited by two moons, Phobos and Deimos, which differ significantly from our moon in size and shape. When observed from Mars, these moons appear much smaller in the sky compared to our moon's appearance from Earth. Phobos presents a relatively larger appearance in Mars's sky, while Deimos appears as a distant, tiny object revolving around the planet. Despite their diminutive size, these moons possess their unique charm. One of Mars' rovers notably captured a rare solar eclipse, an extraordinary event worth seeing. Visualize Mars gradually obscuring the sun, showcasing its rugged and captivating allure. This remarkable phenomenon boasts visual splendor and causes a noticeable dimming of the surrounding light. Like Earth, Mars has its own set of seasons because it tilts. Mars sees its versions as we experience different seasons here on Earth, with frigid winters up at the poles and relatively warmer summers near the equator. These caps stick around at the ends of Mars during winter, much like what we have at Earth's poles. These caps are mostly ice. In these images, you can see the caps getting bigger and smaller as Mars moves between its seasons. When the ice in these caps turns into gas, it creates fast winds, up to about 250 miles per hour. Scientists believe these changing patterns are caused by how things move around on Mars. These images show the swirling shapes giving us a glimpse into how the seasons change on Mars and how the planet behaves throughout the year. Mars gets its nickname the Red Planet because of the rusty iron oxide on its surface making it look red. Photos from NASA's Mars rovers reveal a landscape with many reddish-brown colors in rocks and the ground, giving us a glimpse of what it's like there. The photos snapped during the Viking mission more than 40 years ago show Mars as a busy planet, even though it looks empty. Mars is bustling with activity. In 2008, a spacecraft circling the planet caught a considerable avalanche that kicked up a massive dust cloud, revealing dunes that were about 700 meters tall and stretched for four miles. These dunes keep changing all year round, forming ridges as dust settles. Craters from impacts also change the landscape, showing signs of water ice melting and leaving visible trails. Many pictures taken from above show cool stuff like a ginormous dust cloud, almost 800 meters tall and 30 meters thick. The shadow it makes is about two kilometers wide. Rovers even caught videos of these dust devils cruising around. When Mars' fast winds stir up the ground, substantial dust storms cover the whole planet. You can see these storms from space. Remember that dome-shaped dust thing in 2012? It settled down within a week. These photos and observations reveal how lively Mars is, with its ever-changing scenery and ongoing activity. Another remarkable feature of Mars is Valles Marineris, an expansive canyon stretching across the Martian surface that dwarfs Earth's Grand Canyon, three times lengthier and four times more profound. Mars boasts an imposing mountain, ranking as the solar system's second tallest and hosting the most prominent volcano known. Olympus Mons, Exceeding Mount Everest in width spans over 600 kilometers and rises to remarkable heights due to its massiveness. Its appearance resembles a colossal mound on the Martian landscape, adorned with craters at its summit and a colossal cliff outline towering up to 8 kilometers high. 
The absence of a magnetic field on Mars, which vanished 4 billion years ago, exposed the planet to solar winds that steadily eroded its atmosphere, a compelling phenomenon meticulously observed by orbiting spacecraft. Because of this, breathing on Mars poses a significant challenge due to its air being predominantly carbon dioxide. This means anyone visiting Mars will be required to wear a specialized spacesuit. Let's explore the massive world of Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. Get ready for some mind-blowing facts that'll change how you see this colossal gas giant. Did you know Jupiter is like the heavyweight champ of planets, being a whopping 318 times heavier than Earth? Its gravity is more than twice as strong, pulling in 95 moons and smashing asteroids like nothing. But hold on, there's more. Have you ever wondered about Jupiter's crazy storms? Picture a massive storm, big enough to swallow our entire planet. And that's just the start of what Jupiter can do. Join us as we uncover the secrets of Jupiter's magnetic field, its weird rotation that is faster than a merry-go-round, and the stunning light shows it creates. You are also going to learn why Jupiter might be the unsung hero protecting our planet from space chaos. We will cover all that and more in today's video. In today's video, we explore Jupiter's wonders. Jupiter the largest planet in our solar system might seem small compared to the enormous Sun, which holds nearly all the system's mass. But here's the surprise. Jupiter's size greatly matters. Even though it's only about one thousandth the size of the Sun, its mass is two and a half times greater than all the other planets combined. Interestingly, the barycenter, the point between Jupiter and the Sun where their combined mass balances out, isn't inside the Sun. It's located more than one sun radius away from the sun's core. Now you might be wondering, what is a barycenter? Well, when one thing goes around another, the smaller one doesn't affect the bigger one much. The barycenter is like a center of balance between them. Because Jupiter is so giant, it doesn't orbit the sun's center. Instead, Jupiter and the sun orbit around this balance point, which in this case, is above the sun's surface. If this still needs clarification, look at this simple picture for a better idea. Even though Jupiter is a giant planet, the point they both spin around is way closer to the Sun. Now, regarding its size, Jupiter is a giant planet, but it's not tightly packed. If Neptune grew as big as Jupiter, it would be the heaviest. If Jupiter shrunk to Earth's size, Earth would weigh over four times more. Jupiter is 11 times wider than Earth and weighs 318 times more. Its gravity on its surface is 2.53 times Earth's. That means that if you weighed 100 pounds on Earth, you would weigh 253 pounds on Jupiter. That strong gravity pulls asteroids and holds onto at least 67 moons. Jupiter is a hero to the inner planets of the solar system. Without Jupiter doing its job like a cosmic vacuum cleaner, dangerous stuff like asteroids and long period comets could freely wander around our solar system and if they collided with a planet, would cause serious damage. Growing up, I always wondered if Jupiter would eventually become a star. But sadly, experts say Jupiter would have to be a lot heavier, about 75 times more massive to become a star. This is true, even though its size is comparable to miniature red dwarf stars that we know of. Jupiter, the Sun's fifth closest neighbor, sits five times farther from the Sun than Earth. Despite its distance, it's the third brightest thing we see at night, after the Moon and Venus. Using a handheld camera, spotting Jupiter in the dark is a piece of cake. Its brightness at its peak can cast shadows and catch the eye of sky enthusiasts. So what causes all of these eye-catching patterns on Jupiter? Well, the planet's thick layer of clouds, about 31 miles deep, holds ammonia crystals similar to Saturn's. But the beautiful colors come from compounds heating up deep inside Jupiter and rising to the surface. These compounds are called chromophores. They mix with the sun's UV light when it reaches the clouds, creating stunning stripes of different colors. This cycle keeps changing Jupiter's appearance. Even though the colors may change, the positions of these stripes stay the same, although their widths may vary. Storms and turbulence brew where these stripes meet, giving us Jupiter's famous Great Red Spot. The colossal storm on Jupiter has amazed folks since the 17th century because it's massive enough to swallow up our entire Earth. Even though it's been around for a while, it's been shrinking over time, which is odd. Scientists aren't entirely sure why it's reddish, but they think it's because sunlight breaks down some chemicals there, giving it that red color. 
This storm sits way higher in Jupiter's atmosphere than other clouds, which grabs more sunlight, making its color pop. A newer storm called Red Spot Jr. emerged when three storms merged. It's become a big deal on Jupiter. It might stick around for hundreds of years until it is absorbed by the Great Red Spot. As for what Jupiter is made of, it's mostly hydrogen. First it is a gas, then a liquid, and then it turns into a metal as you go deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. We're still determining what's deep down inside because we can't replicate Jupiter's super high pressures here on Earth. We assume that an icy or rocky center is probably beneath that. In total, about 90% of Jupiter is thought to be hydrogen, 10% helium, and a bit of methane, ammonia, and other things. Jupiter also has its own rings, although they're not as fancy as Saturn's. The giant ring is narrow but bright, while the others are wider and more challenging to see. The main ring is about 6,500 kilometers wide and has an excellent Metis notch. One unique thing about Jupiter is its super strong magnetic field, 14 times stronger than Earth's. This strong field comes from the planet's liquid metallic hydrogen center, making Jupiter's magnetic field the strongest of all planets. This powerful field pulls solar winds towards Jupiter's poles, making those fantastic auroras. Jupiter's four biggest moons are protected from these solar winds because they orbit within this magnetic field. Jupiter's four largest moons are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and they are some of the largest in our solar system. Ganymede is even bigger than the planet Mercury. Jupiter is the fifth planet from the Sun, hanging out between the asteroid belt and Saturn. It's about 778 million kilometers away from the Sun. This means a year on Jupiter is nearly 12 Earth years. Jupiter only has a slight tilt, which means it doesn't have significant changes in seasons like Earth and Mars. Another interesting thing about Jupiter is how fast it spins. It only takes this beast 10 hours for a complete spin. But because it's not solid, its spin changes a bit, taking about 5 minutes longer at the poles than at the equator. Jupiter's massive size and job protecting our solar system are pretty cool. It's like a guard, stopping things that could cause big trouble for Earth. We are zooming in on the sixth planet and the second largest planet in our solar system, Saturn. Among the celestial bodies in our solar system, Saturn stands as a personal favorite, aside from Earth itself. Through the astounding images captured by the Cassini probe, we've been granted unparalleled glimpses into the beauty of this planet. I aim to showcase the breathtaking Cassini images and provide a comprehensive overview of the sixth planet from the Sun. In today's video, we are exploring the planet Saturn. Saturn is immense. As a gas giant, it boasts an average radius approximately nine times that of Earth, ranking as the second largest planet in our solar system. However, its equatorial and polar radius differ by almost 10%, measuring 60,000 kilometers at the equator and 54,000 kilometers from pole to pole. With an average density of 0.687 grams per cubic centimeter, Saturn's mass surpasses that of 95 Earths due to its sheer volume. Despite being one-eighth the average density of Earth, it holds the title of the lightest planet per cubic centimeter, being around 30% less dense than water. This remarkable low density can be attributed to Saturn's composition, which primarily comprises 96% hydrogen, the lightest element. Imagine a bath toy mimicking Saturn's density. It would effortlessly float. However, more than assessing a planet solely by its average density is required. Classified as a gas giant, Saturn predominantly consists of gas visible to us, devoid of a solid rocky surface beneath its cloud layer. Nonetheless, Saturn's substantial mass prevents it from being entirely gaseous. As one delves deeper into the planet, the escalating pressure transforms hydrogen from a gas into a liquid, forming what can be likened to a liquid hydrogen ocean beneath the atmosphere. Further below, a layer of metallic hydrogen might exist, where hydrogen behaves like a metal. Under its surface, Saturn likely holds a core made of rock and metal. Inside, things get seriously hot, reaching an intense 11,700 degrees Celsius at its core. That's twice as hot as the Sun's surface. Check this out. When you look at Saturn using infrared technology, it's a sight to behold. It glows in these amazing colors like electric blue, sapphire, and mint green. Even on the dark side, without direct sunlight, Saturn still lights up its surroundings. That light comes from deep within Saturn, 
making its way up and spreading into space. Saturn sends out 2.5 times more energy into space than it gets from the Sun. We figured that out by using infrared images. Just like Jupiter, Saturn has these cool bands in its atmosphere. You can see them better when you play with the contrast in the images. These bands on Saturn are wider near its middle, like its waistline, and more organized than Jupiter's bands. The yellow color you see on Saturn? That comes from ammonia crystals high up in its atmosphere. But don't be fooled by its calm look. Saturn's a busy place. The winds on Saturn race at about 1,800 kilometers per hour, placing it the second fastest in our solar system after Neptune. Sizable storms, such as the notable Great White Spots, appear every 30 Earth years. However, recent observations signal alterations in this cycle. This suggests a potential shift in Saturn's patterns, potentially signaling the approach of new storms shortly. The demise of the Cassini mission limits our ability to observe these phenomena, relying mainly on the Hubble Space Telescope. Lightning storms on Saturn, though seemingly faint, produce radio waves converted to audio that are a thousand times more potent than Earth's lightning. Saturn's poles host enduring colossal storms, unique with eyewall clouds resembling hurricanes, but on a much larger scale. The North Pole exhibits a hexagon-shaped storm, larger than Earth's diameter, formed due to atmospheric properties possibly influenced by speed differentials and viscosity. Current theories supported by laboratory experiments suggest these unusual formations stem from specific atmospheric conditions. Additionally, Saturn possesses a magnetosphere, possibly originating from its metallic hydrogen layer. Saturn, an expansive celestial body, wields a formidable magnetosphere that deflects the sun's solar wind, extending its influence beyond the planetary boundaries. Like other planets with magnetospheres, Saturn showcases mesmerizing auroras, the vividness and placement of which hinge greatly on the pressure exerted by the solar wind. As solar wind pressure increases, Saturn's auroras intensify and migrate closer to its poles. This phenomenon mirrors Earth's, where electrons from the solar wind traverse magnetic field lines, penetrating the upper atmosphere. Collisions between these electrons and atoms or molecules trigger an elevation in energy levels. Consequently, these excited atoms and molecules emit radiant light in various colors and wavelengths. On Earth, this luminosity primarily stems from oxygen atoms and nitrogen molecules, whereas on Saturn, it emanates predominantly from hydrogen. Saturn's most renowned feature, its ring system, comprises 10 continuous main rings. Despite their alphabetical nomenclature, identifying these rings might pose a slight challenge. The initial five rings, D, C, B, A, and F, vary in luminosity and proximity to the planet, spanning a distance from 66,000 km to 140,000 km above Saturn's core. Composed chiefly of water ice with traces of dust and rocks, these rings exhibit a notable discrepancy in ice concentration between their inner and outer regions, evident in ultraviolet observations. Visual representations employing radio occultation techniques reveal the diverse particle sizes constituting the rings. The color scheme denotes particle dimensions. Red signifies particles larger than 5 centimeters. Green indicates those smaller than 5 centimeters. And blue represents particles less than 1 centimeter in diameter. These observations suggest that, while most ring particles are microscopic, none exceed 10 meters in size. Moreover, the primary rings range in thickness from a mere 10 meters to approximately 1 kilometer. Despite how captivating they are, Saturn's rings could be more perfectly symmetrical. They go through changes now and then, especially during the planet's equinoxes. When we look closely, we see some pretty cool stuff within the rings, like ridges and spokes that are a few kilometers tall. You can spot these because they cast shadows that stand out. These changes, which might be caused by a moon's influence or happen naturally, can make the rings shift up to 200 kilometers in just one day. Let's focus on one particular ring of Saturn, the F ring. There's something exciting happening there thanks to a moon called Prometheus. This little satellite, about 102 kilometers wide, stirs things up in the F ring as it goes around Saturn. As Prometheus moves in its elliptical path, which takes about 14.7 hours, it gets farthest from Saturn and closest to the F-ring. 
When it's there, its gravity pulls stuff from the core of the F-ring, making these distinct ripples. Past the F-ring, there are more rings, the Janus or Epimetheus ring, the G-ring, the Pauline ring, and then the E-ring. When the sun shines on them, they become visible. The E-ring stands out in blue, and the faint Pauline ring is the easiest to see. After them, there's the G-ring and the Janus or Epimetheus ring. Finally, the Phoebe ring recently discovered extends far beyond Saturn, likely originating from Saturn's moon Phoebe. This extensive ring, if visible from Earth, would span the size of two full moons. The Phoebe ring's dust affects Iapetus, Saturn's outermost regular moon, coloring it distinctly. Iapetus, tidally locked, exhibits two contrasting faces due to its exposure to the Phoebe ring. Saturn hosts at least 82 moons, with Titan being its largest, surpassing Mercury, boasting a unique thick atmosphere. Among these moons, Mimas, often referred to as Saturn's Death Star, stands out. However, most of Saturn's moons are relatively small. Saturn's orbit places it 9 to 10 times farther from the Sun than Earth, resulting in a 30-year duration for one Saturn year. The planet's varied rotation speeds across its surface lead to different day lengths, approximately 10 hours and 14 minutes at the equator or poles, and 10 hours and 38 minutes elsewhere. Saturn's enchanting appearance, with its graded colors and majestic rings, remains a subject of curiosity among scientists, possibly influenced by seasonal variations and cold temperatures in its winter hemisphere. Exploring Saturn, despite Cassini's insights, still leaves much uncharted. We are zooming in on the seventh planet from the Sun and the third largest world in the solar system, Uranus. A planet known as the Ice Giant might seem like a barren expanse in the distant parts of our solar system. But it holds remarkable distinctions, setting it apart from other planets. We will cover all that and more in today's video. Today, let's dive into the intriguing planet Uranus. It's a bit of an oddball among the planets. While the rest are named after Roman gods, Uranus gets its name from the Greek god of the sky, Uranus. Beyond just the name, Uranus is unique in how it moves around. It's the seventh planet from the Sun, almost 19 times farther away than Earth on average, sitting at about 19.2 astronomical units, AU. Even though Uranus seems pretty far off, it's got a special place in our cosmic lineup. Its name and its far-off orbit make it stand out in our sky. What's interesting about Uranus is how much its orbit changes. It swings about 1.8 astronomical units, AU, during its journey around the Sun, which is more than any other planet. Uranus is this fascinating cosmic puzzle that beckons us to explore more about its mysteries and what makes it so different from the rest of our celestial neighbors. Its considerable distance from the Sun results in extreme coldness, with temperatures dropping to minus 220 degrees Celsius, making Uranus the coldest planet in our solar system. Spanning 84 Earth years, Uranus's year initially puzzled astronomers who, upon observing its orbit, failed in their predictions. This deviation led to the discovery of Neptune, as scientists deduced the presence of an unseen planet exerting gravitational influence. Similar hypotheses surround the elusive Planet X, or Planet 9, suggesting perturbations in the orbits of outer solar system objects due to an undiscovered celestial body's gravitational pull. Efforts are underway to pinpoint and identify this mysterious planet. Uranus's unique feature lies in its rotational pattern, deviating from the typical planetary motion seen in most. Instead of spinning like a top on the solar system's plane, Uranus rotates like a rolling object for significant durations during its year. Its staggering axial tilt of 97 degrees causes erratic seasons, leading to extremes in sunlight and darkness. During its solstice, one side of Uranus gets non-stop sunlight, while the other side always stays dark. It's like Uranus is rolling around the sun. The middle part has hardly any changes between day and night. But at the poles, 
It's 42 years of pure darkness, followed by 42 years of constant daylight. When it's equinox time, Uranus acts more like how days and nights work on Earth. The last equinox happened in 2007, and now Uranus is shifting away from that, moving back to its solstice. Surprisingly, Uranus spins fast, completing a full turn every 17 hours and 14 minutes. But because it's made of gas, different parts move at different speeds. Some areas whirl around in just 14 hours because of super strong winds. This peculiar rotation and extreme axial tilt result in an unusual energy distribution from the Sun. Despite receiving more solar energy at its poles on average, the equatorial region remains hotter, a phenomenon that still baffles scientists. There's an ongoing discussion about why Uranus spins differently, but it's widely believed that a massive planet collision knocked it on its side. Let's size up Uranus. It's the least hefty gas giant, roughly 14.5 times Earth's mass, slightly lighter than Neptune at 17 Earth masses. In terms of sheer dimensions, Uranus boasts a diameter a tad larger than Neptune's spanning a colossal 50,700 kilometers, roughly four times the circumference of our home planet. Despite its comparative lightness, Uranus maintains a gravitational force that isn't far behind Earth's. Clocking in at 8.7 meters per second squared, or roughly 0.89 times Earth's gravity, this force remains substantial despite Uranus's more dispersed mass distribution. When it comes to what's inside Uranus, it likely has a slightly smaller core than Earth's, surrounded by a mix of rocky stuff like silicates, water, ammonia, and frozen methane. The layer around the core is super hot at almost 5,000 degrees Celsius, like a liquid ocean. Despite being called a gas giant, Uranus isn't all gas. Its atmosphere, weighing only half as much as Earth, isn't much compared to what's inside. It's mostly helium, hydrogen, 2.3% methane, and a cloudy layer that gives Uranus its blue-green color. Below Uranus's surface, there's something pretty cool happening. Extreme pressure down there might change methane into diamonds. This could mean that deep down, there's a sort of liquid diamond or carbon layer with little bits of diamond floating around. Fascinating, right? Now let's talk about Uranus's rings. It's got 13 dark, young rings, mostly a few kilometers wide, made about 600 million years ago, after the planet formed. These rings are made of tiny stuff like ice and dark matter and barely reflect light. How did these rings show up? Maybe from big crashes with Uranus's many moons. Those moons might guide some rings, but that only explains why one ring is so narrow. The story of Uranus started in 1977 when astronomers noticed a star getting dimmer as Uranus passed in front of it, showing there were rings around Uranus. Voyager 2 took a close look in 1986 and found 11 rings. Later, the Hubble telescope spotted two more rings, one way farther out than the others. Now let's discuss Uranus's moons. Uranus boasts 27 moons categorized into three groups, 13 inner moons, five major moons, and nine irregular moons. The inner moons likely contributed materials to the planet's ring system, with Puck being the largest at a diameter of 162 kilometers. These inner moons constantly influence each other, hinting at potential collisions in the future. The five significant moons, Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon, vary in size and composition. Titania stands out as the largest, about 1,600 kilometers in diameter, while Umbriel is notably the darkest. Except for Miranda, which is mostly water ice, the others are believed to be a mix of rocky and icy materials, possibly housing liquid water beneath their surfaces. 
An intriguing similarity exists between the axial tilts of these large moons and Uranus, causing them to experience prolonged periods of sunlight during the solstice. This alignment results in a scenario where, during the solstice, one side of the moon faces the sun constantly, creating an enduring daytime. Uranus's last nine moons are considered irregular, likely captured objects that orbit much farther out than the larger moons, like Oberon. These moons vary in size, ranging from 20 kilometers to the largest Sycorax, which boasts a diameter of about 200 kilometers. Let's delve into Uranus's climate and magnetosphere. Uranus experiences unique seasons due to its exceptional axial tilt. Technological telescope advancements have only allowed us to study Uranus's surface details for decades. Consequently, it's challenging to track changes between Uranian years definitively. The pole brightens. However, observations reveal that as the planet nears, solstice and a collar forms. Conversely, moving away from solstice, the pole and collar dim. This brightness likely results from thickening methane clouds, although the exact cause remains unclear. Seasons also impact storms in the upper atmosphere, which are comparatively infrequent on Uranus, but are believed to be tied to seasonal changes. Improved telescope technology has revealed bands encircling the planet, primarily visible in infrared light, a feature Voyager couldn't capture in visible light. Another distinctive trait of Uranus is its unusual magnetosphere. Unlike most planets, its magnetosphere doesn't originate from the geometric center or align with the rotational axis, it's off by 59 degrees. This peculiar placement results in a stronger magnetosphere at the North Pole than at the South. Theories suggest that a liquid diamond ocean could deflect the magnetosphere or that it might not even originate from the core, but instead from the liquid mantle. Despite this oddity, Uranus's magnetosphere is comparable in strength to Earth's. Due to its unique rotation, its magnetotail extends millions of kilometers into space, spiraling off in a corkscrew pattern. That covers a comprehensive overview of the intriguing world of Uranus. We're taking a deep dive into Neptune, the eighth planet from the Sun. It's the farthest known planet in our solar system, and we're peeling back the layers to explore its intriguing secrets. From its distant orbit to its captivating storms and enigmatic moons, Neptune stands as a celestial marvel worth exploring. Stay tuned as we unravel the secrets of Neptune's frigid atmosphere, its rapid winds, and the mesmerizing rings that encircle it. Plus, will delve into the intriguing behavior of its moons and the captivating mysteries that continue to baffle astronomers. We will cover all of that and more in today's video. In today's video, we are exploring the planet Neptune. Now, when astronomers observed Uranus deviating from predicted orbits, Urbain Le Verrier in 1846 postulated the existence of an unseen planet with meticulous calculations, he pinpointed where this celestial body should be, leading Johann Galle to remarkably confirm its existence near the projected location. Shortly after Neptune's discovery, its largest moon, Triton, emerged into our awareness. Despite its presence, Neptune remained a mystery due to its vast distance from Earth, impeding comprehensive study via ground-based telescopes. Not until Voyager 2's arrival in 1989 did a wealth of information about the planet become accessible. The spacecraft unveiled Neptune's appearance, confirmed its planetary rings, and unearthed a trove of previously unknown moons. Fast forward to today, where we stand poised to delve deeper into Neptune's mysteries and revelations. Neptune, currently recognized as the eighth planet from the Sun, stands as the most distant planet following Pluto's reclassification. Positioned approximately 30 times farther from the Sun than Earth, Neptune resides at an average distance of 30 astronomical units, AU, equating to about 4.5 billion kilometers. This substantial distance signifies that a space probe, utilizing present technology, 
would require approximately 13 years to reach this celestial body. The vast orbit of Neptune demands a staggering 165 years to complete a single revolution around the Sun, meaning that since its discovery, only one Neptunian year has elapsed. This extensive distance from the Sun contributes to Neptune's frigid atmospheric conditions with an average temperature plummeting to minus 201 degrees Celsius. With an axial tilt of 28 degrees, comparable to Earth and Mars, 23 degrees and 25 degrees respectively, Neptune experiences seasons akin to those on our planet and Mars. However, each of Neptune's seasons spans a lengthy 40 Earth years. Currently, the southern hemisphere of Neptune is undergoing its summer phase, displaying an unusual increase in brightness attributed to interactions with the Sun. Despite the Sun being significantly dimmer on Neptune, about 900 times fainter than on Earth, this interaction results in a peculiar phenomenon. The southern hemisphere experiences a rise in temperature of approximately 10 degrees Celsius compared to other regions causing the release of methane gas into the stratosphere, while elsewhere on the planet methane remains frozen within the troposphere. Neptune's atmospheric layers comprise the troposphere, followed by the stratosphere, with the mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere extending beyond. The incredible wind speeds on Neptune make it the fastest among all planets, with equatorial westward winds reaching a staggering 2,160 km per hour nearly approaching supersonic speeds. Most of Neptune's winds blow in the opposite direction of the planet's rotation. This leads to the formation of distinct bands and massive storms on the planet's surface. In 1989, when Voyager 2 flew by Neptune, it observed the Great Dark Spot, a storm as large as Earth in the planet's atmosphere. Another storm, the Small Dark Spot, was seen south of its larger counterpart, as Voyager 2 approached, the Great Dark Spot changed color from dark to light. Astronomers curious about these storms' longevity used the Hubble telescope in 1999 to observe Neptune. Surprisingly, these storms had vanished, with new storms appearing intermittently. Additionally, large bright clouds at high altitudes were observed to appear and vanish. The contrast in atmospheric activity between Neptune and Uranus despite their similar composition and size, raises questions. While Uranus experiences fast winds, they don't match the intensity of Neptune's winds at 900 km per hour. This disparity can't solely be attributed to interactions with the Sun or seasonal changes. Despite Neptune being farther from the Sun, Uranus holds the title of the coldest planet in our solar system. The difference might stem from their internal heat. Neptune emits heat from within, whereas Uranus lacks significant excess heat, possibly due to a collision billions of years ago, depleting its primordial heat. This discrepancy in internal heat might explain Neptune's more active weather patterns. Let's take a look at the materials that form Neptune. Its inner structure and atmosphere closely resemble those of Uranus. Its atmosphere is primarily composed of 80% hydrogen, 19% helium, and traces of methane. This methane contributes to Neptune's distinct blue hue, although darker than Uranus's cyan shade. Neptune has a liquid mantle comprising water, ammonia, and methane ice enveloping its core. The intense pressure at their juncture might cause methane to break down, forming diamonds under extreme conditions. These diamonds might not resemble those we commonly know, possibly existing as solid diamond formations in a liquid carbon ocean, or even raining down within the mantle like hailstones. Estimates suggest immense pressure around Neptune's core, approximately 7 million times greater than Earth's surface atmosphere. Neptune's magnetic field, akin to Uranus's, deviates by 47 degrees from its rotational axis. Initially thought to link to Uranus's unusual axial tilt, this theory faltered when the same was observed in Neptune, which maintains a more standard axial tilt. The current explanation is that the magnetic field may not originate from the core, but possibly emerges from a conductive liquid mantle or gets redirected by the mantle, leading to this peculiar offset relative to the rotational axis. In our solar system, planetary magnetic fields don't align perfectly. Even Earth's magnetic north differs from the geographic north pole. However, Uranus and Neptune stand out with their significantly tilted magnetospheres. Neptunian auroras exist, but appear faint due to minimal solar particle charging 
and the magnetosphere's orientation, primarily manifesting as type B auroras or SAR arcs. Contrary to typical expectations, Earth experiences similar phenomena, although they remain invisible to the naked eye, requiring scientific instruments for detection. SAR arcs distinguish themselves by their location. Unlike polar aurorae, they occur around mid-latitudes rather than the poles. Now stepping back from Neptune, let's delve into its ring system. Similar to other gas giants, Neptune has a ring system, albeit faint due to its low density and dark color. Because of their faintness, distance from the sun, and backdrop of space, these rings are challenging to observe. There are five known rings, each named after individuals involved in Neptune's discovery and research. Starting with the innermost Galley ring spans 2,000 kilometers, faint yet quite wide. Following is the Le Verrier, the first bright ring, only 113 kilometers wide. Connected to it is the Lassell ring, a faint band spanning 4,000 kilometers. On the outer edge lies the Arago ring, slightly brighter and less than 100 kilometers wide. Finally, the outermost and most extensively studied Adams ring is merely 35 kilometers wide, but notably bright. It holds interest due to its slight inclination and the presence of bright arcs within it, which have remained stable since their discovery in 1980. This unique feature differs from the typical uniformity seen in planetary rings, although the cause of these arcs remains a mystery. Now, shifting focus to Neptune's moons, there are 14 known ones named after Greek water deities. The largest, Triton, carries most of the collective mass of Neptune's moons. Triton stands out for its captivating burnt orange hue and intricate patterns. Notably, its retrograde orbit and inclination toward Neptune's rotation suggest it might have been captured rather than forming alongside Neptune. Triton's presence might have disrupted other moons' orbits, potentially causing collisions and leading to the creation of Neptune's rings. Another significant moon, Proteus, surpasses Saturn's Mimas in size at 400 kilometers across, despite not being spherical due to past collisions resulting in colossal craters. Neptune's moons consist of inner, regular ones orbiting the rings, some acting as shepherd moons, and outer, irregular moons likely captured from elsewhere. The farthest moons, Samothy and Neso, have the longest orbital period among planetary satellites, taking 25 years to orbit Neptune once. Owing to Neptune's vast hill sphere, the region where its gravity prevails over the Sun's influence. Today, join me on an expedition to discover the wonders of Pluto. Now, you might remember Pluto as the ninth planet, but in 2006, it got a cosmic demotion and is now called a dwarf planet. That shift caused quite a stir, shaking up what we knew about our solar system. But even though it lost its planet tag, Pluto's still a star in its own right, chilling way out there, teaching us loads about what it means to be a planet. So stick around because we're diving into Pluto's journey from the ninth planet to dwarf planet and why it's still one fascinating space neighbor. We are exploring Pluto's wonders. Pluto, positioned approximately 40 times farther from the sun than Earth, orbits the solar system center every 248 years in an elongated path. Its small radius of 1,188 kilometers makes it notably smaller than all planets and even some moons, including our own. Despite its mass being a mere 1.3 times 10 to the power of 22 kilograms, about 1 18th of our moon's mass, Pluto shares similarities with smaller celestial bodies like Ceres or Sedna, this classification led to its designation as a dwarf planet in 2006. Due to its elongated orbit, this distant object experiences a lengthy orbital cycle, reaching its closest point, perihelion, to the Sun at 29.7 astronomical units in 1989. However, it will hit its farthest point, the aphelion, at 49.3 astronomical units in 2113. Because of its extreme distance and dimness, Pluto remains invisible to the naked eye and appears as a murky brown disk, lacking surface details even in Hubble Space Telescope images. The New Horizons uncrewed station embarked on a mission in 2006, taking 9.5 years to reach Pluto. It transmitted over 6 gigabytes of data and captured around 400 observations during its 2015 flybys. Unfortunately, due to its trajectory, New Horizons couldn't photograph the entire surface, but circled around to explore other celestial bodies. Regarding its structure, current models suggest Pluto possesses a substantial core, 
roughly 1,700 kilometers in diameter, composed of ice and rocks. Enveloping this core is a 300 kilometer ice mantle, possibly undergoing tectonic activity that remains relatively unstudied. A surface crust of crystallized gases, nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide caps the mantle. Some theories suggest that Pluto's core produces enough heat to melt parts of the icy mantle beneath its surface. This might create a deep, salty, and hazardous ocean containing lots of dissolved ammonia. The planetoid's surface temperature is frigid, not surpassing 60 Kelvin or negative 213 degrees Celsius. Now, let's continue our exploration of Pluto with one of its most notable features, the Tombaugh Regio. This expansive region sits along the equator, resembling a heart-shaped sketch. Covering about a quarter of Pluto's surface with a size of 2,300 kilometers, the Tombaugh Regio isn't uniform. Its western part, Sputnik Planitia, spans 1,492 kilometers and appears smooth, lowland. Sputnik Planitia is coated in nitrogen ice, carbon monoxide, and solid methane. These substances give it a light hue, reflecting up to 90% of the incoming light. Surprisingly, it lacks many craters, indicating its relative youth in geological terms. One widely accepted idea suggests that Sputnik Planitia formed around 100 million years ago after a colossal collision with another celestial body. This impact created a massive crater filled with material from Pluto's hypothetical inner ocean, which promptly froze. The terrain's features, like smooth areas bordered by hills and depressions, resemble convection cells seen in heated fluids. This suggests clues about the frozen ocean's behavior under extreme conditions. This provides evidence supporting the theory of Pluto having a warm interior. Tombaugh Regio is encircled by notably high mountain ranges, with Hillary Montes situated to the west of Sputnik Planitia and reaching heights of about three and a half kilometers. These mountains, known as Tenzing Montes, are positioned in the southern area of the heart of Pluto. Some of these peaks soar over six kilometers above the dwarf planet's average surface level, making this ridge the tallest one discovered on Pluto. Remarkably, these formations are predominantly composed of water ice, which under the extreme cold temperatures of Pluto becomes as solid as rock. Moving southward reveals a profound basin surrounded by substantial layered ridges of ice and rock. This area is speculated to be the outlet of an ancient cryovolcano, with the adjacent rock formations believed to be frozen residues from its eruptions. Understanding the chemical composition of these formations is crucial for scientific exploration, as it offers insights into Pluto's internal structure. The eastern segment of Tombaugh Regio appears darker and is marked by numerous craters, suggesting it is significantly older than Sputnik Planitia. As we venture eastward along the equator of Pluto, we encounter a series of significant dark spots known as maculas. These expansive features, some hundreds of kilometers wide, derive their names from various dark deities across cultures. One such macula is named Balrog. Collectively, these maculas create a colossal formation known as the Brass Knuckles, encircling the celestial body along its equator. Separated by towering mountain ranges, these maculas exhibit surfaces marred by extensive crevices, some stretching hundreds of kilometers. The most prominent, Cthulhu Macula, extends westward from Tombaugh Regio, spanning nearly 3,000 kilometers. Reflecting a mere 30% of the incident light, it presents a striking contrast to the nearby bright and luminous Sputnik Planitia. While the precise nature of these maculas remains elusive, it is hypothesized that their dark hue stems from a high concentration of tholin and numerous impact craters. This suggests their remarkable age. Cthulhu Macula's surface is diverse, featuring undulating relief in the western part, a smooth plain in the central region, and an eastern section adorned with mountains and craters. Moving away from Chulumakula towards the north, we encounter Lowell Regio, a vast valley encircling Pluto's North Pole. Surprisingly, this area is currently the most illuminated part of the dwarf planet's surface. This unusual illumination results from Pluto's significant axial tilt, causing its North Pole to face the Sun. Consequently, despite its increasing distance from the Sun, Pluto's atmosphere has notably thickened over the last three decades. Solar rays are suspected to evaporate nitrogen ice, concentrating at the poles and contributing to the planet's atmosphere. Pluto's orbital dynamics set it apart from other solar system planets. Apart from its considerable tilt concerning the ecliptic plane, Pluto experiences cyclic oscillations near a specific point in its orbit due to the gravitational influence of its large satellite, Charon. 
With a mass of 1.52 times 10 to the power of 21 kilograms, approximately 11% that of Pluto, Charon creates a shared center of mass between the two bodies, resulting in tidal locking. Consequently, both Pluto and Charon always present the same sides to each other. Like Pluto, Charon's surface exhibits significant darkness and showcases abundant water ice mixed with methane and nitrogen in select regions. Charon, along with other satellites, orbits Pluto. Most of these satellites are smaller and have irregular shapes. For instance, the Nix and Hydra, discovered in 2005, are several tens of kilometers in size. Subsequent discoveries like Kerberos and Styx are even smaller, not exceeding 16 kilometers in diameter. These celestial bodies are primarily composed of water ice and were likely drawn into Pluto's orbit due to its gravity from the Kuiper Belt. Unfortunately, during the New Horizons probe's mission, its cameras didn't capture a substantial portion of Charon. However, visible features on its surface have piqued interest. For instance, south of the equator lies the Vulcan Planum, spanning an area of at least 400,000 square kilometers, comparable to the size of an average European country. This region boasts the tallest summit on Charon Kubrick Mons, with a diameter of around 40 kilometers and an estimated height of 4,000 meters. Some suggest it might be a cryovolcano, possibly causing the surrounding air to sink due to underground reservoir activity. Moving north, the Oz Terra is marked by numerous craters and separated from the Vulcan Planum by towering ledges and crevices, reaching up to a kilometer in height. Serenity Chasma, the largest among them, stretches 200 kilometers in length, 40 to 50 kilometers in width, and possibly plunges 7 kilometers deep, making its exploration challenging due to steep shadows. Closer to the pole is the enormous Mordor Macula, approximately 475 kilometers in diameter, whose origin is still a subject of debate. The prevailing theory suggests that nitrogen and methane from Pluto's atmosphere might have gathered at Charon's poles, transformed into tholin due to ultraviolet radiation and concentrated in its ice. This hypothesis requires further exploration of future missions. Charon remains largely enigmatic, as our research has just begun. Despite being one of the most intriguing structures in the solar system, the Pluto-Charon system is vastly unexplored. The New Horizons probe departed long ago, and these celestial bodies continue to move away from us, carrying their mysteries. Presently, the probe is over 50 astronomical units away from Earth, intermittently transmitting crucial data. By 2030, its systems will likely fail, leaving the probe isolated in the depths of space leaving us with the task of deciphering the data it has sent before its demise. Today we're diving deep into the cosmic wonderland, the asteroid belt. Buckle up because we'll uncover some facts about these rocky space travelers in our solar system's backyard. The solar system operates like a finely tuned machine when observed broadly. However, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter lies a zone of disorder. Here, numerous small celestial objects speed through space in various directions. Occasionally, their paths intersect, leading to collisions that generate thousands of fragments and pieces. This region is highly unpredictable, making it challenging to anticipate its future appearance. This space is known as the Asteroid Belt, and is one of our solar system's most unpredictable and enigmatic areas. We are exploring the Asteroid Belt. More than 300,000 small celestial bodies in this region have been officially named and given specific labels. Remarkably, their total count might exceed 1 million. The exploration of the asteroid belt traces back to the 18th century when astronomers first noticed a puzzling object in the sky. This sighting came after an extensive search for the fifth planet. This celestial body seemed to possess planetary qualities. Still, it was so minuscule that even the most cutting-edge telescopes of that era couldn't distinguish its disk. According to researchers, this newfound object resembled a luminous dot like a star named Ceres. Soon after, astronomers identified similar celestial bodies, prompting the need for a new term to describe them. These peculiar astronomical objects were termed asteroids, meaning star-like. Beyond asteroids, this solar system area is abundant in cosmic dust. As these minute particles orbit, they scatter sunlight, creating a subtle, pale glow known as the zodiacal light. In equatorial regions of the Earth, observing something interesting with the naked eye is possible. There used to be a widespread belief that the objects in the asteroid belt were remnants of a shattered planet. However, this assumption doesn't hold up today. Firstly, the combined mass of all the main asteroid belt objects is relatively small, just 3 times 10 to the power of 21 kilograms, 
which is merely 4% of the moon's mass. Even considering many asteroids might have left long ago, the remaining rocky debris falls far short of creating a planet-sized object. Secondly, calculations suggest that sizable celestial bodies couldn't have formed in this part of the solar system due to the gravitational pull of Jupiter. Mathematical models have shown that the most significant formations in the asteroid belt never exceeded a thousand kilometers in diameter. Jupiter's immense gravitational force destabilized their orbits, leading potential protoplanets to collide and break apart into smaller fragments. Evidence of these collisions is still detectable. Most objects in the main belt cluster together to form asteroid families, groups of asteroids with similar compositions and origins. These families likely emerged from these destructive collisions. The main asteroid belt lacks precise boundaries, primarily spanning from 2.06 to 3.27 astronomical units from the Sun. These limits, known as Kirkwood gaps, are influenced by Jupiter's gravitational pull, leading to fewer celestial objects within these zones. Interestingly, these gaps exist at the belt's edges and within, with two significant gaps at 2.5 to 2.8 astronomical units demarcating the belt's inner and outer regions. Ceres, the largest object in this area, boasts a diameter of around 940 kilometers and contributes substantially to the belt's mass orbiting between 2.5 and 2.9 astronomical units from the Sun. At its closest point, Ceres experiences temperatures dropping to 239 Kelvin. However, its average temperature remains around 167 Kelvin. Ceres, once classified as a planet before being reclassified as a dwarf planet in 2006, stands as a unique presence in the asteroid belt due to its spherical shape, which differs from most other objects in this region. With a mass of nine points, four times 10 to the power of 20 kilograms, Ceres is approximately 6,000 times lighter than Earth. The celestial body is believed to have a solid rocky center surrounded by a frozen layer, approximately 100 kilometers thick. Nearly half of its volume, or around 20 to 30% of its mass is water ice. This body is Vesta, residing in the inner region of the asteroid belt and it holds the title of the largest and most massive known asteroid in our solar system. Measuring roughly 525 kilometers in diameter and having a mass of about 2.6 times 10 to the power of 20 kilograms. Vesta follows an elliptical orbit around the sun with its farthest point, aphelion, at 2.57 astronomical units and its closest point, perihelion, at around 2.15 astronomical units. It completes a full orbit in three to six Earth years. Vesta's visibility to the naked eye sets it apart, owing to its substantial size and reflective surface, which reflects about 42% of the light it receives. The distance between Vesta and Earth is approximately 177 million kilometers, or 1.18 astronomical units. Scientists theorize that Vesta has a composition akin to a fully formed planet with a metallic core primarily consisting of nickel and iron, along with a rocky mantle. Its surface temperature fluctuates between negative 190 and minus 20 degrees Celsius, though it was warmer in the past. Distinctive dark areas observed on Vesta's surface, mainly in its western hemisphere, are likely to be basalt plains due to volcanic activity or collisions with large celestial bodies. The asteroid showcases a remarkable geological phenomenon, the enormous impact crater Rhea Silvia. This vast crater stretches across an astonishing 500 kilometers in diameter. It plunges to depths of approximately 25,000 meters. The solar system's second largest mountain is nested within this crater, towering over 22 kilometers high. What's striking is how this crater's size nearly matches Vesta's, hinting at a massive collision in the asteroid's history. This colossal impact created Rhea Silvia and generated numerous smaller fragments, now identified as the Wester's asteroid family. This family encompasses over 15,000 objects, making up about 5% of all celestial bodies in the main belt, acknowledged by modern science. Experts suggest that most asteroid families result from catastrophic collisions among significant celestial bodies. These debris pieces are sometimes drawn together by gravitational forces, often forming a new astronomical entity. However, this fresh formation may lose its solid structure, occasionally termed rubble piles. For instance, Sylvia, among the largest objects in the asteroid belt, appears to fit this description. Sylvia's dimensions are measured at 384 by 262 by 232 kilometers, 
with a mass equivalent to 1.5 times 10 to the 19th kilogram. Interestingly, this asteroid's average density is slightly higher than water's, estimated to be around 20% more. Calculations propose that approximately 25 to 60% of Sylvia's volume might consist of empty spaces. Sylvia takes roughly six to five years to complete a full orbit around the sun. At its farthest point from the system's center, its orbit extends to 3.7 astronomical units. At the same time, at its closest, Sylvia approaches within 3.2 astronomical units. Following a collision, some debris doesn't merge with others, but becomes satellites of the new celestial body. Sylvia hosts two such companions named Romulus, measuring 18 kilometers in diameter, and Remus, around 7 kilometers in size. The composition of these objects has yet to be thoroughly examined, and likely, they're not uniformly solid. There might also be smaller satellites around Sylvia that have yet to be detected. Pallas, another significant object within the asteroid belt discovered in 1802, is the second largest asteroid following Ceres. Its diameter averages around 512 kilometers, with a mass approximately 25% less than Vesta's. Pallas's orbit is notably elongated and tilted at 35 degrees to the ecliptic plane, posing challenges for probe-based studies. Its orbit spans roughly 4.6 years, and its distance from the system's center undergoes substantial changes, ranging between 2.1 and 3.4 astronomical units. The palace surface displays abundant craters, surpassing even the larger asteroids like Ceres and Vesta. Research suggests it primarily consists of silicate rocks with hints of iron and water, akin to Vesta. This resemblance indicates its potential as a surviving protoplanet, providing valuable insights into the solar system's formation. Unlike more prominent asteroids like Vesta, most are only visible with specialized equipment. One such elusive celestial body is the irregularly shaped Intermedia, measuring 306 by 348 by 310 kilometers. Despite contributing approximately 1.2% of the total mass in the asteroid belt, Intermedia still needs to be studied more. Its dark surface absorbs roughly 93% of incoming light, further complicating observations. Inner Amnia belongs to an incredibly uncommon type of asteroid called Spectral Class F, a subgroup of Carbonaceous asteroids. Analyzing its reflection reveals that its surface color is uniform, indicating a lack of major collisions for a significant period. The density of Inner Amnia is relatively low, just twice that of water. Scientists suspect it consists of a solid rocky center covered by a thick layer of ice, with its surface coated in substantial quantities of fine dark dust. This asteroid takes about five years and four months to complete an orbit around the sun, residing on the opposite side of the four most prominent objects in the main belt. Its distance from the sun fluctuates between 2.5 and 3.5 astronomical units. While its orbit intersects with significant bodies like Ceres and Pallas, the likelihood of collisions between them is minimal. The main asteroid belt comprises millions of objects, ranging from dwarf planets to small meteoroids. However, vast distances separate these objects, reducing the chances of spacecraft encountering any of them to an almost negligible level. Although significant collisions in the solar system region producing new debris happen approximately once every 10 million years, Exploration of these asteroids is ongoing. Asteroids, despite their size, hold significance for scientific and practical purposes. They offer insights into the early solar system's formation and are potential sources of materials for future space exploration endeavors. Although the timing for such endeavors remains uncertain, every rocket launch inches us closer to the space exploration era. Thanks for joining me on this exploration of the asteroid belt. Today, we're diving into the incredible Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper is a part of our solar system that's reshaped how we understand space. This region, sitting way out there beyond Neptune, is like a cosmic treasure trove waiting to be explored. Please think of the Kuiper Belt as this massive collection of icy leftovers from when our solar system first formed. It's home to intriguing characters, including dwarf planets like Pluto, Haumea, and Maki Maki. But that's just the tip of the cosmic iceberg. The Kuiper Belt stands as a vast, disc-shaped region in the outer reaches of our solar system, extending from Neptune's orbit, approximately 30 astronomical units, to around 50 AU away. Picture it as an extensive counterpart to the asteroid belt, yet notably more significant, spanning 20 times the width 
and possessing 20 to 200 times more mass. Unlike the rocky composition of asteroids, the Kuiper Belt predominantly comprises icy remnants from the solar system's formation, housing frozen volatiles like methane, ammonia, and water. Notably, this belt hosts three officially recognized dwarf planets, Pluto, Haumea, and Makemake, along with potential origins for some of the moons in our solar system, such as Triton and Phoebe. Consider the Kuiper Belt as the outer frontier of our solar system, comprising tangible objects within our reach. While it represents a significant part of our celestial neighborhood, the absolute boundary of the solar system differs, marked either by the heliosphere, governed by magnetic fields, or the Oort Cloud, where the sun's gravitational influence wanes. The Kuiper Belt holds immense intrigue, especially considering that its true nature eluded us for a considerable period. Dive into its depths to unravel the mysteries and significance of this captivating region in space. The Kuiper Belt's exploration traces back to Pluto's discovery in 1930. It sparked widespread speculation about the possibility of other celestial bodies in its vicinity. The concept of this region has been theorized for years. It wasn't until 1992 that tangible evidence supporting its existence emerged. Prior conjectures about its nature had caused ongoing uncertainty regarding the true originator of the idea. The initial inkling about a trans-Neptunian population was proposed by Frederick C. Leonard shortly after Pluto's discovery. He wondered whether Pluto was the first among a series of undiscovered ultra-Neptunian bodies. Simultaneously, astronomer Armin O. Leuschner also suggested the potential existence of numerous long-period planetary objects of which Pluto might be one. The discovery of Pluto was anticipated to be a definitive find, prompting deeper investigations into the planet. However, it raised questions about whether it revealed everything about its surrounding region. In 1943, Kenneth Edgeworth hypothesized that beyond Neptune, the primordial solar nebula's material couldn't coalesce into planets, but instead formed numerous smaller bodies. He proposed that these bodies, occasionally venturing into the inner solar system as comets, inhabited the outer solar system. Edgeworth's description aligns closely with the essence of the Kuiper Belt, emphasizing that its constituents didn't evolve into full-fledged planets, a concept we'll delve into shortly. New insights emerged as astronomers delved deeper into the mysteries surrounding the Kuiper Belt. Speculations swirled around its nature, history, and existence. Some proposed that it was a remnant of the early solar system, no longer present today. However, these notions were largely speculative and lacked substantial evidence. Advancements came in small increments. Discoveries of new celestial bodies between Jupiter and Neptune expanded our understanding but fell short. Subsequent evidence supporting the Kuiper Belt's existence surfaced from comet studies. Comets, known for their finite lifespans, dissipate as they approach the Sun, requiring frequent replenishment to endure for billions of years. The Oort Cloud, a cluster of comets hypothesized by Jan Oort, contributes long-period comets, like Hale-Bopp, with orbits spanning millennia. This revelation holds significance beyond mere curiosity. Computer simulations by Quinn and Tremaine revealed that not all observed comets originated from the Oort cloud, especially short-period ones clustered near the solar system's plane. To bridge this gap, Tremaine introduced the concept of a belt, echoing Fernandez's description, leading to the term Kuiper Belt. In 1987, Astronomer David Jewett, then at MIT, noticed a puzzling lack of celestial bodies in the outer solar system. This stood out, considering the richness of our solar system. He enlisted graduate student Jane Liu's help to explore what lay beyond Pluto. Their aim? To uncover what others had only theorized about, the Kuiper Belt. Their approach differed. They used advanced technology, faster reporting methods, and broader telescope access. After five years, on August 30, 1992, Jewett and Liu made a breakthrough the discovery of the potential Kuiper Belt object, 1992 QB1. Soon after, they found a second object, and by 2018, they'd unearthed over 2,000 Kuiper Belt objects. As space probes ventured closer, the Kuiper Belt revealed itself as a vast, disk-like formation, reshaping our understanding of the solar system. This discovery altered our perception of the system and redefined it in significant ways. In 1930, Pluto was discovered and initially labeled as the ninth planet in our solar system. However, as our understanding of the Kuiper Belt expanded, doubts arose about Pluto's planetary status. Other dwarf planets, some rivaling or surpassing Pluto in size, emerged within the Kuiper Belt, 
surrounded by a multitude of celestial objects. Everything pivoted in 2006 when the International Astronomical Union sought a clear definition of what constitutes a planet. After extensive deliberation, they established three critical criteria for a celestial body to qualify as a planet. Subsequently, Pluto, Eris, Maki Maki, Haumea, and others failed to meet these criteria and were reclassified as dwarf planets. Despite objections and ongoing protests, with many staunchly advocating for Pluto's planetary status, the scientific consensus now concludes that Neptune marks the boundary of our traditional planets. Meanwhile, the Kuiper Belt houses a distinct category of celestial entities known as dwarf planets. The Kuiper Belt, home to various celestial objects, often features moons or binary systems. Binaries are pairs of similar-sized objects orbiting a shared center, sometimes even touching to form a peanut-like shape known as a contact binary. Notable Kuiper Belt objects, KBOs, like Pluto, Eris, Haumea, and Quawar, possess moons. Recent telescope observations of NASA's New Horizons spacecraft suggest it might be a contact binary. What makes binary KBOs intriguing is their likely ancient origins, which have remained relatively unchanged since their formation. The formation of these pairs likely involved low-speed collisions among KBOs, enabling them to stick together due to mutual gravity. In the past, when KBOs followed more circular orbits closer to the planet plane, ecliptic, such collisions were more frequent. Due to varied orbits, collisions are rarer and often more destructive. The Kuiper Belt, a remote area beyond Neptune, witnessed its initial exploration with NASA's Pioneer 10 spacecraft in 1983. However, the first close encounter with an object in this belt occurred in July of 2015 when NASA's New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto and its moons. On January 1, 2019, New Horizons achieved another milestone by successfully flying by Arakoth, a celestial body in the Keeper Belt. The data returned revealed Arakoth to be a contact binary, measuring 32 kilometers in length and 16 kilometers in width. The onboard RALF instrument on New Horizons confirmed Arakoth's red color, providing valuable information about its composition. The information gathered during this flyby will continue to be transmitted over the next 20 months. Presently, no plans are underway to dispatch another mission to explore the Kuiper Belt. After Pluto was reclassified as a dwarf planet, most consider our solar system to have eight planets. Yet, Strong evidence points to the likelihood of another celestial object. Speculation about an extra planet has been ongoing, especially as recent investigations of the Kuiper Belt have intensified. Scientists initially predicted and later confirmed the existence of outer planets by studying the orbits of specific objects and their gravitational effects. In the Kuiper Belt, the peculiar behaviors of particular objects suggest that our current understanding of gravity might not wholly explain their motions. This discrepancy hints at the possible existence of a significant celestial body, dubbed Planet Nine for now. Consequently, various endeavors are in progress to delve deeper into the Kuiper Belt, aiming to gather solid proof supporting the existence of this presumed ninth planet. As we consider the future of space exploration, one pertinent area of interest is the Kuiper Belt. This celestial region has sparked speculation regarding potential human activities once we expand our reach within the solar system. Beyond scientific study, discussions have arisen about extracting resources from the larger celestial bodies in this belt. Another concept revolves around establishing stations on the dwarf planets within this vast expanse. The expansive size and depth of the Kuiper Belt offer numerous possibilities for exploration and utilization. We're diving into the incredible mysteries of the Oort Cloud. We're talking about a massive icy zone way beyond Pluto, where trillions of objects dance in the vastness of interstellar space. Stick around because we're exploring everything, from the wild comets that journey thousands of years to reach us to the mind-boggling distances these celestial wanderers travel. You'll learn about Voyager 1, our intrepid space probe pushing the boundaries of exploration like never before. We are exploring the Oort Cloud. As a part of NASA's Voyager program, Voyager 1 began its journey as a space probe in 1977. Its primary goal was to explore the outer reaches of our solar system, a vast and enigmatic space far from the sun's warmth. Within three years of its launch, Voyager 1 conducted flybys of the gas giant planets and their moons. By the 1980s, it charted a course away from our solar system, venturing into interstellar space. Over nearly four decades of travel, Voyager 1 has facilitated humankind's exploration of all eight planets within our solar system. 
along with the various belts of matter that lie between them. Despite this achievement, our solar system spans billions of kilometers, and the distances between star systems are even greater. Voyager 1 maintains a speed of around 17,000 kilometers per second, covering roughly 1.5 million kilometers daily. However, it won't come close to another star in our galaxy for approximately 40,000 years, long after it ceases functioning and goes silent. During its prolonged and solitary voyage through the vastness of the galaxy, the probe will venture beyond the frigid outer reaches of our solar system, delving into the boundaries of interstellar space. Ultimately, it will mark a historic milestone as the first human-made probe to reach the farthest edge. But what lies at this edge? It's neither a planet nor a belt akin to those within the inner solar system. Instead, it's an expansive and diffuse cloud comprising trillions of icy objects, forming a shell encasing our solar system, the Oort cloud. This colossal cloud likely extends over a distance of more than a light year, serving as the outermost boundary of our solar system. The Oort cloud is a theoretical collection of icy debris encompassing our solar system. It spans from tiny particles to massive mountain-sized fragments, primarily composed of water, methane, and various other elements. Unlike the orderly orbits within the inner solar system, this cloud forms an extensive shell surrounding our system. It sits thousands of times farther from Earth's orbit, stretching trillions of kilometers into interstellar space. This vast region marks the outermost boundary of our solar system, known as the Sun's gravitational influence. Objects within the Oort cloud don't follow the same orbital patterns as planets closer to the Sun. They move independently, affected by nearby stars and the galaxy's gravitational pull. While no definitive objects have been spotted here, this cloud likely houses the distant comets observed as they enter our solar system. Objects beyond Neptune's orbit, including those within the Oort cloud, fall under the category of trans-Neptunian objects. As we move farther from the Sun, distances are so immense that we measure them in astronomical units, AU, with each AU representing Earth's distance from the Sun, roughly 150 million kilometers. About 5 AU from the Sun lies the snow line, where temperatures drop enough for water and other substances to exist as solid ice, leading to an accumulation of material. Neptune orbits at roughly 30 AU, and beyond it lies the Kuiper Belt a vast disk of ice and rock remnants from the early solar system, forming a thick, spinning donut shape. The Kuiper Belt, spanning from Neptune to about 50 astronomical units away, houses around 100 million comets, minor planets like Pluto and Quawar, planetoids such as Makimaki, and even Neptune's moon Triton. Triton likely originated within this belt before Neptune's gravity captured it. Despite its vastness, the Kuiper Belt is dwarfed by the incomprehensible scale of the Oort Cloud. This distant region within our solar system is astonishingly expansive. Light from the Sun takes about four and a half hours to reach Neptune's orbit. It takes another three hours to traverse the Kuiper Belt, followed by roughly ten more hours to reach the heliopause. However, this boundary at 123 astronomical units is merely the start. The inner edge of the Oort Cloud around 2,000 astronomical units away, extends even farther, up to an estimated 100,000 astronomical units spanning a light year into interstellar space. Despite light taking almost two weeks to reach its interior, crossing from one end to the other requires a staggering 18 months, showcasing its immense scale. Both the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud likely formed from remnants of our solar system's early disk, with planetesimals flung far beyond by gravitational forces, shaping these distant reservoirs of celestial material. Trillions of pieces of debris settled into the inner solar system belts we know today, but much was ejected beyond the planet's reach. Some left the solar system entirely, possibly journeying into other star systems, or settling into interstellar space. Objects in the Oort cloud orbit the Sun in a gravitational limbo, influenced primarily by the Milky Way's tidal force rather than the Sun's direct pull. Moreover, simulations of the early solar system suggest that the Sun formed within a cluster of 200 to 400 stars, much closer together than they are now. These stars likely exchanged debris before drifting away into the vastness of interstellar space.
Consequently, a significant portion of objects within the Oort cloud might have originated from interactions between the Sun and its neighboring stars, potentially even the majority of its contents. The Oort cloud, a celestial enigma known for 70 years, remains unconfirmed, yet its existence is strongly inferred through the trajectory of long-period comets. These comets, believed to originate predominantly from the Oort cloud, journey vast distances into our solar system. Composed of rock and ice, these comets begin their journey from the solar system's outer reaches, and as they approach the sun, the surface ice vaporizes, forming a distinct trailing coma. Comets fall into two main types based on their orbits. Short-period comets, circling within 10 astronomical units from the sun, often originating from the Kuiper belt or scattered disk, long-period comets take over 200 years to complete their orbits, making their appearances rare and their origins more mysterious. Ernst Opik and Jan Oort proposed theories in the 1930s and 1950s suggesting a vast comet reservoir of about 20,000 astronomical units from the Sun as the source of these enduring comets. Oort's observations hinted at this reservoir's spherical nature, distinct from the band-like Kuiper belt, adding to the enigma of the Oort cloud's role as a source of these captivating celestial wanderers. Named after Jan Oort, the Oort cloud consists of a large spherical outer shell and a smaller disc-shaped section known as the Hills Cloud, or Inner Oort Cloud. The Hills Cloud, starting around 2,000 astronomical units and potentially extending much farther, holds the highest concentration of comets in our solar system, estimated to be at least five times more than the outer Oort cloud. Comets from the Hills Cloud are regularly nudged out by gravitational forces, replenishing the outer cloud and ensuring a continuous supply of comets. The Hills Cloud, believed to be replenished by the scattered disk, is a probable source for comets reaching the distant Oort Cloud. While Sedna, a sizable celestial body similar in composition to Pluto and discovered in 2003, orbits in an extraordinarily elongated path potentially associated with the Hills Cloud due to its peculiar orbit stretching far beyond typical scattered disk objects. Meanwhile, the outer Oort cloud, holding an estimated 2 trillion objects, presents a challenging detection prospect due to its vastness. Its mass, approximately five times that of Earth, spans an extensive area, making identifying faint small objects within it particularly difficult. External influences, such as passing stars or the Milky Way's tidal force, occasionally disrupt these objects, causing some to become visible as comets, as observed with instances like Comet Sighting Spring in 2019 and the well-documented Comet Hale Bop discovered in 1995. They are shedding light on their elemental compositions and migration paths within the solar system. Comet Lovejoy, discovered in 2011, belongs to the Kreutz Sungrazer comets, which have orbits that bring them very close to the sun. In 2011, it passed through the sun's corona, surviving but significantly affected by the sun's radiation and heat, becoming visible from Earth during the Christmas season, earning the moniker Christmas Comet of 2011. Although no object within the Oort cloud has been identified yet, five man-made spacecraft will eventually venture there. However, these won't be dedicated missions, but remnants of interstellar probes from previous tasks like Voyager 1 and 2, Pioneer 10 and 11, and New Horizons. However, due to the immense distance, it will take well over 500 years for these probes to reach the inner edge of the Oort cloud and thousands of years to cross it entirely. By that time, all five spacecraft will have ceased functioning. While a concept mission called the Thousand Astronomical Unit spacecraft aimed to explore the Oort and Alt clouds, it never materialized, despite proposals in the 1980s and renewed interest in the 1990s. Reaching the Oort cloud with a probe and transmitting data back within a practical time frame seems unattainable due to the vast distance involved. However, technological advancements might enable us to search for Oort cloud objects from Earth more effectively. In 2014, NASA proposed the Whipple mission to develop an observatory for spotting distant celestial objects called cloud objects using transit technology. Despite not making NASA's shortlist, the mission secured funding to advance its research. This technology, which is advancing rapidly, holds the potential for detecting smaller objects within the Oort cloud, similar to how telescopes identify planets beyond our solar system. 
The likelihood of other star systems having Oort cloud-like formations is reasonable, with many stars in the Milky Way likely housing collections of comets. However, observing them is challenging due to the vast interstellar distances. The enormity of space remains overwhelming, limiting our understanding of other star systems. The Oort cloud is one of many unseen elements in the night sky. Each twinkling light hides intricate systems that stretch from planets and moons to their remote Oort clouds, all within the vast expanse between stars. Thanks for joining me on this exploration of the Oort cloud. If you got value from this video, hit the like button and leave a comment, as it supports our work and helps boost this channel to new orbits. Also, click the subscribe button below to be in the cosmic loop when we release new videos. Until next time, stay curious, keep exploring, and I'll see you in the next video.